There are few stories in sport more unlikely or inspirational than that of Ian McKinley. One of perseverance, one of never allowing himself to quit, no matter how great the obstacle that stood in his path. McKinley just needs one pass inside, Treviso has gone inside, and it's McKinley gets the second try for Treviso, and there still is time for what would be a serious upset here. Be running onto a field with people shouting when your name gets called. That's what I'd imagined when I was a young kid growing up. What Ian has done is remarkable. I think he's a fabulous example, you know, of how to beat adversity and be mentally tough. One big rip on the ground, I just found myself on my back. Just a teammate stood on my face and his stud went into my, my eyeball and it just per perforated it. The tear is too big, so you've lost complete vision in that eye. To overcome the disadvantage in terms of sight, you know, he doesn't want to be labelled by that. Ian's one of those people that you just can't fault in terms of their professionalism. A phenomenal individual, so... Um... And yeah, now he's changed the face of the game. I just want to be seen as a, as a normal player and I think that's you know, slowly but surely definitely changing. I'm helping this guy kick at the moment, he's just moved club. Just do a bit of place kicking with him this morning and uh, yeah, this is what, fourth week I've been with him so Hopefully we'll see some sort of improvement. <laughs> you have been to stamattina. Okay. Second me, the top. I would have played Leinster schools, Ireland under 19s, uh, and from there I think coaches were happy with how I was progressing as a player, going through the ranks. Of, to make that jump from school straight into the academy was 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 a big jump. To suddenly being in a situation where you've got a backline with Contraponi, Darcy, O'Driscoll, Dempsey, Horgan, um, Fitzgerald, all these world-class players. I mean, it's a huge jump. So. What what Ian has done already is remarkable. But I think what I've gone on record as saying is that he would whack me in the face if he was sitting across to me and I started talking about it. Let, let people write the book and read the story, uh, make the movie after his career. He's a rugby player. He's a wonderful rugby player. Uh, he's had challenges the whole time. And I think he's a fabulous example, you know, of how to beat adversity and, uh, and be mentally tough. Luke Fitzgerald said to me once in training, he said, you know, how are you getting on? And I said, you know, I just have to pinch myself that I'm uh, training with these guys. And he just goes, you just don't think about that. Just think of them as normal, normal players and you want to get to the highest position that you can get to. Those guys, you need to, you need to push them. Yeah, I think my mentality on, on, on that side of things maybe slightly changed as I got a bit more mature. I certainly learned a lot from, from those, those guys. You're learning all the time. You just got to take in as much information as possible. Well, I, I met Ian for the first time uh, last year. Very good rugby player. Um, you know, has has uh, obviously to overcome the disadvantage in terms of uh, sight. But as he said, he, he doesn't want to be uh, you know he doesn't want to be labelled by that. He he goes and he plays matches and he wins matches because he's a terrific rugby player. I played my first game with with the senior team against the Dragons, and it was the week before the 2009 Heineken Cup final. So to go from being in schools rugby six or seven months previously to you know suddenly playing in the in the Magnus League was it was a big jump. I was, I was playing with Ian at the time, and we'd been away on a few trips. I remember sitting beside him on the plane. So like obviously he was a younger player. He had something quite special about him when he was younger. Um, you could see. You know, I was getting to play, as I said, with all these really really talented. Irish rugby players, so that was sort of a little box ticked, as it were, um, but it just obviously made, made me want to have more. I just needed to keep learning, keep developing, but uh, yeah, the path that I was on, I was, I was relatively satisfied from where I'd come from. One of my really good mates has just taken up a job in, in a new club, and this guy has just moved, uh, moved to that club and he plays 10 as well, so he just asked me to help him out. So this is the fourth week, I think, we've been, we've been together, so see that, that one? He tried to absolutely whack it and it didn't go anywhere near where it was meant to go. So be nice to the ball and hopefully the ball will be nice to you. Okay. 4 su 5 eri troppo vicino. Okay. Come on. Treviso is called Little Venice because it's got all the canals here and everything I mean it's okay it's a bit of rain at the moment but normally the sun is shining and 
Uh, like it is quite picturesque and it's just a pretty calm town. There's never much, you know, it's not, it's not too busy, but yet it's not too quiet, which I like the balance. Um, and from my wife and stuff, there's a lot of art, which she's really into and she loves all that sort of stuff. So it's, my, par my parents love coming over as well because they love sit being able to sit outside and in nice temperatures at night, been able to have a cup of coffee and a fag. That's, the <laughs> that's what they like. <laughs> that particular game in, in 2010, UCD against Lansdowne, it was top of the table clash in, in our division. So, you know, uh, it was a good crowd and we were playing at home. And I just remember that literally after about two minutes into the game, I found myself at the bottom of a ruck. Just went for one big rip, trying to wrestle possession off a player. One big rip on the ground, I just found myself on my back and just a teammate stood on my face and his stud you know perforated my went into my my eyeball and it just per perforated it so i initially thought it was a de deliberate act because the action was straight down and i heard someone shout my name a split second before um a split second before the actual incident so i got up and started swinging wasn't you know wasn't too happy uh, doctors came on physios came on because the vision had completely gone, so we're gone completely black. And uh, obviously, the doctor said, "Stay still, do not move," because my eye was slightly out. Uh, I won't say it was dangling, nothing like that, not not like a cartoon or something like that, but it was outside the socket from where it should be. So I had to stay completely still. Obviously, with the vision gone, I knew it was quite serious. Uh, was rushed to St Vincent's Hospital uh, with my my brother and my dad. It actually happened to be the only game that my mum has ever missed, <laughs> which is quite coincidental um, where I get hurt. But um, so I went there with, with, with both of them. My mum uh, came along later just to have an x-ray to see if my um, eye socket here was, or my cheekbone was, was broken. Um, and I knew the severity of how, you know, how bad the injury was when people in A&E were just stopping and looking at you. So that's not obviously a nice, nice feeling. So when I was told that I needed to go to the um, Royal Eye and Ear in Dublin city centre, I got into my mum's car and I just said, I want to look at my eye and they sort of pleaded with me. I said, don't, don't look at it because it's not going to help you in any way. But I looked at it and it just, yeah, it was out. And the best way I can describe it is just someone has put layers and layers of cling film over the eye. It was very sort of how my eye is a bit now is really cloudy and um, just didn't, you know, it looked as if I was a zombie almost and had emergency surgery that evening, which lasted about, you know, four hours, I think it was, which is a long time um, for such a small part of the, the, the body. And I just remember waking up the next morning in a bit of pain, like as if someone had just been scratching at my eye, nothing too major, but, you know, it was quite irritated. Um, and the doctor came in and just said, you know, your eyeball has burst, it's quite severe. We've had to clear away a lot of it. Um, the biggest concern from them was that my retina was going to detach because there'd been so much trauma. My surgeon had informed me that this could happen and normally that happens within six months of an accident. I was playing with Ian at the time and we'd been away on a few trips. Um, I remember sitting beside him on the plane, so like obviously he was a younger player coming through the academy. I was uh, certainly an older player at the time, um, but yeah, I remember the time and uh, I was in a game with UCD and the other player that was involved was one of his own teammates. It was just one of those very innocuous things in the game. And um, I went to see Ian then in the hospital. He was in the one of the hospitals just in town, on the, on the edge of town. And uh, I went to see him in there and you're like, well, I hope this is all right for him. It was, uh, yeah, it was a scary enough time now, I must say. I had gone over that six month barrier and um, from being told a year of been out, I managed to actually play my first game after six months. Once, once I had my first contact session, I, rem I remember the first tackling drill, I remember the first pad drill with John O'Gibbs we did, and I just went in and it was just sort of, you know, I was fine and, and just went on. Of course I had to adapt a little bit because obviously being partially blind on one side at that time, as I said, 50% vision, obviously I had to maybe adapt a few things, but for me it was really important just to stick with my instincts as well, uh, making sure that, that, I, that I was confident in, in who I am. Of course, I've, uh, yeah, I've had to change a couple of things uh, at, at that time, but um, I was just happy being back on the field and uh, just sort of forgetting everything about that day. In his third game back from injury, with roughly 50% vision restored in his left eye, McKinley would become the target of an eye gouging. That, that really is the ugly side of the game, which happens on a very 
rare basis. It does happen, and it is important to talk about it. I suppose in my in my scenario, it, the, the one it happened a couple of times, but the one that was really bad was the was my third game back uh, after the incident, and it was my first game with uh, a new club. So it was just maybe a hot hothead who lost his temper and uh, uh, and all the you know my club my club mates at the time when they saw the incident when they heard the incident they were there pretty quickly to reprimand your <laughs> the 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 other guy that was doing it so um for me it's it's gone it's it's passed um but you know that that's the reason that I wear the goggles is because I don't want anything to happen to my my good eye the chances of it happening first and foremost is just a freak the chances of it happening again I just want to minimalize with with the use of those goggles I know fully 100% that playing the game in a safe most safe environment that I can possibly get so that gives me confidence we just scored a try very early on I remember just kicking for the posts and I just remember that the posts are really blurry uh, you know, not not. I, I had gotten 70% vision back at this stage. This is many months later. There was this window of six months uh, of danger that you were in the red zone basically, and I had gone over that three times. So this was 18 months after the initial accident that my retina had detached, which was very very strange from their point of view. I was just with some of my friends and my my family, and the surgeon came in who had dealt with me. Uh, all the way through and just said that unfortunately the uh, retina can, can't be repaired, the tear is too big so you've lost complete vision in that eye so yeah, at that moment uh, it was like a, a death <laughs> to be honest in the room there was plenty of tears and literally was told Ian you can, you can go home so went into the hospital and uh, had the operation hopefully coming back out with some vision and then to be told yeah you have nothing you can go pack your bags and we're sorry we can't help you so that was that was obviously difficult so I took took a few weeks to think of my, my future my eye was still sore thinking to play professional rugby at out half with sort of half vision it could be pretty tricky and then the gouging incident sort of made me uh, doubt you know whether it's a good thing to do. Spoke at length with my dad, who, who I have a huge amount of respect for, and his his words of wisdom. And he just said, "Weigh up the the good with the bad, and if the bad outweighs the good, that's that's your decision." So that's what I did. And unfortunately, went into Joe's office uh, a few weeks later and just said, oh, "I can't, I can't, can't go any further. I'm really upset, like really sad. I can't be part of this club in the future as a player, but I, I just can't do it." So. That was pretty pretty tough to do. When I was playing last year uh, for the games in November, my mum was, my dad was over for one of them, I think, but my mum was over for every every weekend. So, she, I think she feels guilty that she missed that game that I got injured in. <laughs> but there's just so much you can do with pasta and pizza. Except with the pizza, they don't put. I used to love a Hawaiian pizza. You're not allowed to put pineapple on it, and you're not allowed to put chicken on a pizza. So the two pizzas I loved, which were Hawaiian pizza and barbecue chicken pizza, I can't get them here, unless I make them myself. Stanford Gendo in documentario. So you see. His Italian is incredible because he's, he immersed himself and uh, he speaks, you know, with a proper accent, not my Dublin accent that, that comes through when I try and speak it. Um, and the respect that people have for him over here as a person and a player is incredible. Ooh. <laughs> These people behind me said uh, Forza Treviso, which is another rugby club, which is right beside Treviso. So, there's no rivalry between them because they play in different levels, but I have to be careful with what I say. When I first arrived, weather, so I arrived in August and it was 40 degrees already, so the heat was just something I mean, I'd experienced it away, like on holidays with my parents, but just when you're living on a, on a consistent basis, it's just really tough. Uh, the siesta, so all the shops been closed from half 12 to half three, something that is quite difficult to fathom. <laughs> and if you were working in the morning and you needed to go to Vodafone for something and the only time you could have done it was from two to three and it was closed because you'd be back at work at quarter to four or something. So uh, that still, still can be quite frustrating with some smaller shops. They get, they're, they're not open, but yeah, it's just culturally it's completely different the way you eat, the way you drink. 
Um, I don't know if you look around here, everything is generally cleaner. It's just a, it's just a different way of, of, of doing things. So th there's a lot of a lot of different aspects. McKinley says much of his success today is down to his wife, Cordelia. We met in school, so we've known each other for ten years. Just got married last year, but she's you know everything to me. She she's constantly by my side. She makes sure that I don't lose a run of myself. You know, if things go well, she keeps me grounded. If things don't go well, she just you know, picks me up uh, in the way that she sees fit. And, um, you know, I'll always be grateful to her for, for coming with me. So. Having retired from rugby, an opportunity arose to coach Italian amateur side Udine. Basically, there was an Irish guy in a, in a town called Udine in Italy who knew uh, Mick Carney, who was the Irish team manager at the time. They were both Lansdowne guys and rung Mick and said, listen, is there anyone that's young that would be willing to work as a coach here in Italy? There's a new club that's up and coming and we just need someone maybe with new ideas just to, to help out. Mick then rung Colin McEntee, who's now head of the IRFU Performance. Uh, he was my academy manager at the time and just said, I remember I was in Dundrum shopping centre and he just rung me and goes, uh, Ian, how would you feel about working in Italy? And I said, I mean, I, you know, I love pasta, I love pizza, I love wine, so why not? <laughs> why not go there? Um, so I went over once just for a job interview and then went a second time with my then girlfriend to see if, you know, we liked, we liked it, we did and moved over in August 2012. Uh, so this is our, my little, what's known here as your little condominio. So this is for me in probably about five years after playing rugby, the old electric chair up to the, <laughs> to climb up the stairs. Oh, Mel's camera shy. Come on. See the way she's all. Yeah. Then you go to, good girl, yeah? I made it to a Zampa. Good girl, eh? It's just one of my jerseys from November. Um, goggles that I wore for my first cap, etc., etc. Uh, like signed jerseys, stuff. It's good to know kit men from other team. I got Martin Joyce, who's the Connacht man, so he always gives me a Connacht kit. And then one of my good mates, Jack. So if the Ireland Italy game gave me his jersey, he said I was hoping to share, you know, swap it with you for another one but you can have mine so it won't fit me but uh, as you can tell it hasn't been cleaned this Philip gave it to me might not look like anything but Philip gave it to me uh, for my first cap um, I don't think you realize that actually you get towels <laughs> for games we're not in a period where we need to bring our own towels but this was my granddad's towel so he um, he actually lives in my grandparents house so he just gave it to me and it was blue and white Blue and white for Italy. While he enjoyed his role as coach, the ambitious Dubliner knew he needed more, which became evident upon opening the sports pages of a newspaper while in the presence of his brother. I'd signed a three-year contract to be a coach and I absolutely, I loved my job, like I really did. The interaction with people, learning a new language, learning culture, learning, you know, just how a different, different country does things, you know, uh, so it was really, really intriguing for me. But as I said, it was difficult, especially guys in my own position as well, and me just always thinking, you know, I want that to be me. I want, I want to have that fame. I want to have that success. I want to, ha I want to be the best I can be. I just remember my brother came over for a visit. I, I remember particularly there was Leinster were playing in the European Challenge Cup against Wasps. There was a quarter final, I think it was. And at this time, I hadn't watched rugby. Um, I, I just didn't watch it. I think I watched one game, which was Ireland New Zealand, uh, when when Ireland nearly won and in Lansdowne Road. Um, I just didn't do, didn't do it, but I remember just reading in the Italian papers, just seeing the result, Leinster hammering wasps, and all my mates were scoring tries and doing really well. And, and it wasn't even that particular game, but maybe just seeing their names, it just was hard, and getting all the plaudits and everything, and I just broke down with him, and just like, I just want to, I just want to be back as a player, that's all I want, just want to give it another crack, and just try my best. And uh, I think that left a, a lasting impression with him uh, when he turned when he came back to Ireland. I think he just thought I have to try and do something here, and, and my brother is in need, need to do something. My my brother Philip, he is, has been the the one with all the ideas, thinking outside the box. He got in contact with the NCAD, and we were just hoping 
by off an off chance if someone from the design sector would be willing to drop their project to focus on possibly coming up with an idea for protective eyewear in rugby. So this student called John Merrigan just completely dropped his, <laughs> his end of year project with eight weeks to go and he came up with, with these uh, goggles. Now, having said that, IRB, as they were at the time, World Rugby now, were uh, in the very early stages of um, coming up with goggles themselves via a company that is based here in Italy called Raleri. So they were coming up with, with goggles, but Johnny also uh, sort of helped it along and basically we just brought everyone together and we had meetings. I flew over from Italy to come over, especially for them, or if I was busy, I uh, just had Skype sessions with, with people in World Rugby to see if these could be pushed over the line. So those sort of discussions started maybe in mid-2013 and the goggles became available in January 2014. Sometimes I've come back off, like I come off games and I've got, you know, marks here and people go, oh God, your goggles are pushing into you and you're hitting. It's like, well, no, that's just like a hit from someone's head or an elbow or something that's actually protecting me. So, but yeah, I would generally bring four of these for a game um, just to make sure one for the first half, one for the second half and then two physios, one on each side would have one each just in case something happens. So it's the material, polycarbonate, see it's flex flexible but it's you know not much is going to happen and the band the, this is an older version the band the band now is a lot thinner and that sort of thing so and this is actually quite dirty I need to clean it but uh, yeah oh, there have been a few alterations certainly in, in, in my game I'm very much someone though who likes to play on instinct as well I mean if there's uh, you know whatever the defense presents to you is what you've got to play but certainly the example that I use the most is that I'm left footed and obviously I can't see out of my left eye so I've had to change my body position a little bit and how I kick. Another little thing uh, in terms of like catching a ball, you know, most people just wait for the ball to come to you. Uh, a doctor once told me to actually put my hands towards the ball. So when you're catching it, so you keep them in your, in your vision and you put it towards you, which is a, you know, a little thing that helps me. So, but again, you try not to go away from you try not to go away too much from what you you believe is right. The main thing is you're like, what? It's kind of almost like, what what would that feel like playing the game like that with sight in one eye, um, and having the, the goggles on as well at the same time. So um, to see, just to, to sort of try and visualize what that would actually be like, um, you know. So in terms of your awareness of space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so just. It's just respect, really. Like you, just such respect for the guy in terms of like what he's achieved. Um, yeah, incredible. The most challenging of of uh, skill sets under pressure is goal kicking, and to almost change how you stand, how you look at a ball, and to be at the level he does is is remarkable. His game control, he knows what he needs to work on in terms of making that next step, but he attacks the line well. I remember talking to Joe about him a couple of years ago, uh, you know, after a game, Joe Smith and, uh, you know, he was, no doubt, without injury, he was destined for very, very, very big things uh, within, within the Irish system. Um, but Ian got dealt a set of cards and his reaction to it's been incredible and I know he'll work on the areas he needs to, um, to, what he said to me was he just wants to make my life hard. He wants to be a, a problem for me the whole time and he wants to keep on asking and um, that's a great place I hope to be in. I played my first game in March which was with the team that I was coaching so they played in the lowest level of Italian rugby which was actually fantastic because you'd guys of all shapes and sizes from all walks of life and yeah my first game was in March, uh, lash and rain, field was just so muddy uh, couldn't really see properly with the goggles because because of the mud and everything but I didn't care I was back playing and it was a fantastic feeling after three years <laughs> I had a moment with my mum after the game I had a cry a hug and all that sort of thing but I knew you know deep down that uh, that's not the level that I can play at um, that's not where I want to want to get at I had unfin unfinished business as it were physically I was <clears throat> fine I felt like a I felt like a 21 year old, <laughs> there was no reason not to. I hadn't taken contact in three years. So I felt good, but just my mental state, if I was fine, and yeah, I, for me, there was no, no problem. Next thing I see, he's playing rugby, you're like, this is all unfolding. 
Um, but yeah, he's an amazing, resilient character and getting to play again, not just club level. Uh, so he's gone from coaching to playing to, you know, the goggles to et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so it's, it's amazing, really. Like, it's an amazing story, an amazing individual. Uh, the ladder, I suppose, that I've climbed in, in Italian rugby has been a, a long one. Um, but from going with my club uh, in Udine, where I coached and then sort of played, I, I managed to get it uh, out of my contract for the last year because I said, right, I want to go back into professional rugby. I went and got myself an agent and he managed to get me into a team called Rugby Vidana, who play in the top 10 of Eccellenza, so it's the main league of club teams in, in Italy. And I think that summer, when I trained with semi-professionals, professionals, and I knew that my level was just as good as them, for me, that was the... How can I describe? That was the moment that I knew that I was doing the right thing, that the goggles were good, physically, mentally, I was absolutely fine, and that was a moment that gave me huge confidence and re relief. And in that second year, uh, during the World Cup, uh, Treviso and Zebre needed permit players. Um, so Zebre, I was actually living close to where Zebre is based, which is in Parma. I actually lived about five minutes away from the stadium. And uh, they called me up and said, we need backup 10. And I played my first game back in the Pro 12 against the Scarlets. And so that made me the first ever player to play in the Pro 12 with protective eyewear. To be running onto a field with people shouting when your name gets, gets called on the, on, you know, on, on the speakers and everything. Uh, that's what I had imagined when I was a young kid growing up. It was everything I wanted it to be. But I think the reason that I was really, really happy was I was there on merit. Like my performances were really strong. Uh, I was going really, w really well, performing to the best of my ability. So I felt that I earned that that uh, that call up. It wasn't just because okay, we've got another ten here. Oh, Ian plays with the goggles. We give him a sympathy thing. Uh, as the year went on, then I got called up to play against Leinster for uh, for Zebre. So that was in Parma. Ian McKinley is going to take this. Amazing, really, to see him come back from that, that horrific injury, losing the sight in his left eye, as I mentioned, ending up here in, in Italy, playing club rugby, and now getting a chance for Zebre. So he's taken the protective goggles off, for the kick is McKinley, and guides the ball between the uprights. Yeah, it's a brilliant strike for McKinley, and it's a great story, I think. Uh, you know, he's brave to play with one eye, there's no doubt about it. It's a brilliant story, and... Um, I think it's one that we've all followed with, I suppose, a huge amount of uh, interest and probably a fair bit of pride as well, <coughs> given the fact of, of where he's come from. And he's going to continue to progress. And I think that's the good thing about the situation, that, that there's a huge amount more in him and he'll keep getting better. That was very surreal because, uh, you know, you're playing against your mates, you're playing against... Uh, the coaches you'd even play, played against, which <laughs> made me feel very old when you see Leo Cullen and Gervin Dempsey and all there, you, you know, guys that you'd actually played with, that makes you, <laughs> makes you, feel, makes you feel a bit older, but that, that was certainly surreal. On the 11th of November 2017, McKinley would win his first cap for Italy, sealing victory with a kick at the death against Fiji. There's a few things I just remember distinctly. One was uh, the national anthem. Um, my whole family was just in front of me. And I was just blaring it out with such pride and uh, just they had tears in their eyes. I just remember it vividly, particularly my sister and my mum were just uh, bawling their eyes out. As he was on the sideline, I, I heard uh, his family in the, in the stadium. It was very difficult for you in a, an international match, but you heard this raucous and I think his mother came up to me after the game and said, sorry if we were cheering, but it was a special moment. And it is. Uh, the game was 16-10, so it was still in the balance, you know, I mean, it was tight game. I just remember, just do your job, do your job, do your job. You're given instructions on the sideline as to what to do and just you follow those and, and you know, you perform to the best of your ability and the coach can't ask much more from you. But I was really, really happy with how that game materialised in the last 20 minutes, how it sort of panned out. to make the game safe for the Italians, for his newfound nation, Ian McKinley. 
swaps him. A nice moment for the man born in Ireland, but now loving Italy like no one else. All of that is down to down to him. You know, I mean, he he made the decision to come. Uh, to uh, to Italy and and he worked hard at his game and uh, he produces performance that, that allow him to be selected for Treviso and he's got a, an international cap or cap sorry so I mean he's competed at the highest level uh, of the game so all credit to, to Ian. Ian's one of those people that you just can't fault in terms of their professionalism so I'm happy to speak about the professional rugby player that is Ian McKinnon because that's the bloke that I know um, you know in terms of his, his journey and the story he's been on you know, just immense courage that to, to come back from from um, the, the the difficulties that he's had. But I just know a guy that works his backside off week in week out. That, that's the blow that I know, and uh, you know, long may it continue for him because you know uh, he's still getting better as a player, which is uh, pretty remarkable, I think, under under the unique circumstances. Once that was ticked, then it's all about uh, the challenge he has with Tommy, the challenge he has with Carlo. Uh, I didn't know in Ian. I know exactly how he's going to make the challenge. I just want to be seen as a normal player. I think at the start, that was difficult for people. You know, um, oh yeah, there's this goggle-wearing player, which is a bit bizarre for some people, but particularly here in Italy, people just see me as Ian McKinley, and that, that's all I ever want to be, to be seen as. Uh, of course, I'm, I am different, but uh, I want to be taken on my merits. So if I do something well, get the pat on the back like anyone else. If you do something wrong, you get a clip over the year like anyone else so uh, I just want to be seen as a, as a normal player and I think that's you know slowly but surely definitely changing I still get slags you know slag from the crowd every once in a while a few sly comments and stuff but that's all part and parcel of it and take that in your stride and you can use that as some form of motiv motivation I'd be a hypocrite to say as a young boy growing up of course in the garden I would have been you know singing Aaron Nevian I would have been you know hoping to beat England <laughs> uh, and all that sort of stuff but yeah my my perspective has changed completely because Italy has been there for me basically when I needed when I needed someone most they were there for me. Ireland will always be home here is another home I'm just really really fortunate to have two uh, and I'm so lucky to have my friends and my family there but I've got a life here now as well I want to do what's right by Italy uh, I believe that we are improving. I think you can see that in the club teams. There is a progression. Obviously with the national team, we still need a bit of work, but we're, we're working our asses off to get there. And for the World Cup next year, I'm sure you're gonna see a few surprises. I, I have absolutely no doubt in that. And we're working, we're just working our ass off to make Italian rugby competitive because I can tell you from being here for seven years, there is a huge amount of talent. It's just making sure that that talent is channeled into the right areas, making sure you've got the right people in the right places. And I can guarantee you, you'll see a different, different Italy going forward. And the way I believe that I can help or repay that faith that they have given me is by putting my best performances on the field and making sure that I, I do my best for them. Uh, and that's, uh, for me, that's the only way I think I can repay them. On the 3rd of November, 2018, McKinley lined up against his country of birth at Soldier Field in Chicago. It's the Italian, Ian McKinley. He's wearing those goggles. He lost his eyesight in his left eye, but returned three years later with specially manufactured goggles. And while the story to date is unbelievable, no doubt McKinley would tell you there are still more chapters to be written.